I have been speaking uh, at about a number of different meetings for the last 10 days, but I saved the best for last. This is family. This is family. And it is good to be with so many allies of the Great Commission. That's what we are. We're all allies of the Great Commission, both old and new. Have I told you lately that I love you? I love you. I'm proud of you. I pray for you. I thank God for you. Your ministry, your movement, your denomination, your agency, your church matters to God. We haven't all been together like this for about two years since the finishing the task summit a couple years ago. And it's just good to see so many old friends, as I hear, allies in the Great Commission, and some new friends here today. And if you go out of here, you say, do you know Rick once that he is, Rick said, I'm his best friend. So you're my new best friend. <laughs> now, of all the people in the room that are here, we ought to know better than anybody else that no single agency, denomination, movement, et cetera, et cetera, can complete the Great Commission. None of us can do it on our own. There's a, there's a proverb in Africa that says, one drop of rain doesn't make any difference, but a million drops of rain can turn a desert into a garden. In America, we say, snowflakes are frail, but if enough of them stick together, they can stop traffic. By yourself, you can't complete the Great Commission. None of us can. But together, we, we can do this. Now, it's going to take all kinds of churches, all kinds of agencies, all kinds of movements to reach all kinds of people. And it's going to take the church in all of expression, all of its expressions, to reach all people at all places, all for the glory of God. Now, we all know that in 1 Corinthians 12, the I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. In fact, no body part is useful unless it's connected to all the other body parts. An eye disconnected from the body can't see. A tongue disconnected from the body can't talk. An ear disconnected from the body cannot hear. My life, my ministry, your life, your ministry, everybody else's ministry, they're actually ineffective and worthless if we're not connected. When we are connected, there's exponential growth. Now here's the problem. We don't really know how to collaborate. I just was at Lausanne for eight days. I heard talk about collaboration every single day. You know what? When it's all been said and done, a lot's more been said than done. We don't actually know how to collaborate. So we're going to have to learn together. Even Table 71, which I've been a part of for 23 years, 24 years, um, the first 10 years that we met, it was the major mission agencies of the world. We pretty much got nothing done because we didn't know how to work together. And finally, we figured out a few small, limited ways. But we're going to have to do more than that to finish the task of the Great Commission. Interdependence and collaboration in Christ's body, is what I'm saying, it's not merely a nice idea. We're going to either have to do it or we're going to fail. You will fail. I will fail. We will fail unless we figure out, thank you, unless we figure out how to collaborate uh, together. Now, I've been asked to do a couple things uh, in my time this morning. One is to give you an update on your progress in finishing the task around the world as we move toward 2033. And uh, the second is to just say a few words about John 17 or the missional unity for the sake of the Great Commission. So, uh, for those of you who are new to finishing the task, um, finishing the task is not an agency, it's not an organization, it's not a denomination, it's not even a movement. It is an alliance of all those things. Movements, churches, everything like that. And specifically, finishing the task is six different kinds of parts of the body of Christ. 
And you can remember them this way, A, B, C, D, E, and F. A are the agencies. The agencies have been working for missions for hundreds of years. They, are, they don't need to be told the Great Commission is important. They're doing the job. They need to train everybody else. A are the agencies. B are the businesses. We need businesses not simply for them to be patrons with money, but because businesses' missions can get to places that missionaries can't. Not every nation wants a pastor or a Christian leader to come in, but there's no nation that doesn't want investments. So businesses can get into places nobody else can get into. C are the churches, the churches, congregations. That's where all the members are. Agencies have the mission, businesses have the money, but churches have the manpower. I once did a study. During COVID, I read over 200 books on the early church and the history of church mission. And one of the books called 700 Plans talks about David Barrett found 700 different attempts to complete the Great Commission in the last 2,000 years. And it tells every one of them. The Dominicans did this, the Lutherans did this, the Franciscans did this, Camps Crusade did this, et cetera, et cetera. Every one of them failed, obviously, or that's why we're still here. And so I thought, what, what did they, what was missing? And there were two things primarily missing in all the plans previous uh, to uh, complete the Great Commission. The first one is, number one, almost every one of those plans were put together by old white guys from Europe or North America. And I'm going, where are the Africans? Where are the Asians? Where are the Latin Americans? Where are the women who are half the church? And, and so you can't have a plan for the whole world done by a few people on one continent. That didn't fit. And the second of those 700 plans, I studied them in detail for three years. Not a single plan mobilized the people in the local church in the pews. Not one. Not one. And what we have done up to this point is the church has been like a football game or a soccer game where you've got 22 professionals on the field desperately in need of rest and 300,000 in the stands desperately in need of exercise. A few people, all the professionals are doing the work. We will never accomplish it if we don't get the people in the pew mobilized. I wanted to prove you could do it. So in 2004, we started a thing called the Peace Plan at Saddleback Church. And over, we said, by the end of this decade, we will have planted a church, our church, one church, will have planted a church in every nation of the world. I didn't even know how many nations there were. There's 197. 195 are part of the UN. The only two nations not in the UN are China, uh, Taiwan, China won't let them in, and Serbia for war crimes. So we said, by the end of 2010, we will have planted a church in every nation of the world. Over the next six, seven years, I sent out my members, 26,869 of my members to every nation. And on November 18th, 2010, right before the end of the decade, we went to Nation 197. We're the only church that's actually planted a church in every nation. I wanted to prove that a local church could do this with real members. I can teach anybody in the world how to do it. A church of... 50 could send five people, and a church of 100 could send 10. But it is very, very possible. Now, finishing the task is polycentric. What does that mean? There's no Vatican. There's no center control. Movements are by nature uncontrollable. In my area, there's a, a um, uh, nuclear reactor. And the way you control the power of a nuclear reactor is you put control rods in it, and if, if you want to slow down the energy, you put rods in it. If you want to increase the energy, you take the rods out. Here's the point. You have to decide in your ministry, and I have to decide in my ministry, do you want control or growth? You can't have both. The more you're willing to give up control, the more it can exponentially spread. So it's polycentric. There's, there's no Vatican for this theme of finishing the task. People, different denominations are even doing it under different names. Who cares what it's called? We're all committed to completing the Great Commission. And as we said, in nominations, denominations, nations, and generations. Now, for our friends, maybe I should give you a little bit of history on this. The term finishing the task was actually invented by my mentor, Billy Graham. 
I was called and ordained as an evangelist at 16 years of age. I had done 120 Harvest Crusades before I was 20. Billy Graham heard about this long-haired, skinny 18-year-old kid on the West Coast and took me under his wing for the next 42 years. So I got to be involved in all of those ons. I was 20 at the first was on. I got to help teach at the, at the uh, Amsterdam's. And in 2000, Billy said, Rick, I want us to do a conference within a conference called Finishing the Task, and I want you and Paul Eshelman to put it together. And I want you to invite 650 of the leading mission leaders in the world to Amsterdam for 10 days and talk about why have we not completed the Great Commission. So I did that. At one, we had 76 tables, about as many at every table as we've got here. Right in the middle of the table, 76, and I put the largest mission agencies. This is 24 years ago. Campus Crusade for Christ, founder president. Camp, uh, Youth of the Mission, founder president. International Mission Board. Um, work with Bible translators, United Bible Societies. I call them the gorillas. At the end of that conference, that group decided to keep getting together, and we got together for twice a year for the next uh, 23 years. And that was finishing the task 1.0. What do you mean by that? It was only agencies, and we were focused on the 3,600 tribes that had no Bible, no believer, and no body of Christ. And for the last 24 years, we've been taking about 50 to 70 tribes off that list, finishing the task 1.0. In 2019, December, Paul Eshelman, who was founder of the Jesus Film, said, I need to retire. His wife had passed away, and we didn't know at the time that he had early onset dementia. I did Paul's funeral this last year. And the, the 600 or so agencies said, Rick, we want you to, to lead finishing the task. I said, fine. And so then I said, can we expand it in some ways? And FTT 2.0 is this. It's A, B, C, D, E. Agencies, businesses, churches. D is denominations. E is educational institutions. How can colleges and seminaries be involved in the Great Commission? And F is focused outreaches to the blind, to the deaf, to oral society, to immigrants, and a thousand other different targets. That's FTT 2.0. Now, the other thing that I did uh, in the last, since 2020, is I have the largest list of pastors uh, on my mailing list. I, I've, in 40 years, I've trained over a million pastors in 165 nations. So I had all these guys who are friends. So I said, you need to be in the finishing the task. It's not a movement. It's, a, it's, a, it's allies of movements, allies of denominations. And so I said, choose a new name, and we'll start a church network just to commit to finishing the task, Great Commission. They chose the name Healthy Church Teaching Network. And now I'm going to each continent. Last month I was in Peru, 16,500 pastors there for the training. Next month, I'm in Accra, Ghana, 12, 14,000 already registered. Bogota, Colombia, the next month, over 22,000 pastors signed up. This is the fastest growing theme ever. By the end of this year, we'll have between 500 and 600,000 churches committed to finishing the task. What does that mean? We're going to train them how to do what I did with my church, how to turn members into missionaries. What, fin what the, the Healthy Church Network is basically how to turn an audience into an army, how to turn spectators into participators, how to turn consumers into contributors, how to turn members into ministers and missionaries. I know how to do that. I've been doing it all my life, and I'm teaching others. One of the ways we're doing is what we call the peace plan, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Many of you have been doing this. I mean, I'm looking at people who have been doing peace for 20 years, but we... Updated peace for finishing the task because we put, I wanted prayer in the peace plan. And so now, P, -E -A is, P is proclaim the gospel. These are the five things Jesus did. Proclaim the gospel. E, equip believers. Jesus obviously did that. A, alleviate suffering. Twice in scripture it says Jesus went into every village preaching, teaching, and healing. One third of Jesus' ministry was health care. It's not by accident that the first hospital and the first college everywhere in the world, in every single country of the world, was started by Christian missionaries because we are a preaching, teaching, and healing faith. So what did Jesus do here on earth? He did five things. He proclaimed the gospel. 
he equipped disciples, and A, he alleviated suffering. Everybody who came to Jesus in the New Testament came to him out of pain. And I've been teaching pastors for about 20 years. If you just focus on people in pain in your community, your city, you'll grow a church because there are a lot of people in pain and nobody goes through life pain-free. C is contend in prayer. It's how the battle is won. We move forward on our knees. And that's why we're having all this emphasis. And so my first suggestion as the, as the leader of uh, FTT was, number one, let's expand it to be more than just agencies. It now involves A, B, C, D, E, F. Second was, uh, let's adopt 2033 as just our, as our target goal. And the third one was to add a fourth B. We had Bibles, believers, bodies of Christ, and we added breakthrough prayer. And you just heard uh, all about that. Now, one of the things I'm doing, I just wanted you to know this, is that with churches around the world, and we're adding about 30 to 40,000 churches a month to finishing the task. These are churches who were, have not done anything for the Great Commission that are now saying we're going to be focused at. And we give them a medallion at each level of their commitments. So when they say, we want to be a part, we want to be an ally in finishing the task, we give them a member medallion. That says, I want to learn how to train my people to complete the Great Commission in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. And notice it says, and, 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 not then, then, then. The Great Commission is simultaneous, not uh, uh, sequential. A lot of people think the Great, Command, uh, Great Commission says, go first to Jerusalem. Once you reach everybody in Jerusalem, then go to your state. Then once you reach it, go to your nation. Then once you reach the nation, maybe you go overseas. No, it's and, 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 and. It's not uh, simultaneous. It's simultaneous, not sequential. So people become a member uh, uh, church saying our church is going to learn how to send our people around the world. Then the next, once they actually start doing it, they get this one. This is called a model church. And they're, they're, they can become a model for other people. Once they start training another church, they become a mentor church. And they get this third one, mentor church. Once they're tra training more than one church, they become a multiplying church. And once that church assumes responsibility for a city, a state, a country, or a continent, they become a movement church. Just wanted you to know that's where, where we're all going. Now, missional unity for the sake of the gospel. I don't think I should even have to talk about this because you all know about it in John 17. In John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, the word love is mentioned 21 times. Now, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 is Jesus' last words to his disciples on the night before he goes to the cross. As a pastor, who I've stood while people took their last breath maybe hundreds, even over a thousand times where I've heard people say their last words. And what I discovered is that when people say their last words, they mean them. People don't just goof off when they're saying their last words. Jesus' last words, the, great, the five great commissions, Jesus' last words have to be our first priority. So let me just read these words to you. John 15, 7. Just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now you must live in my love. A couple of verses later, he says this, I am commanding you to love each other with the same love I've loved you. And here's how you measure that kind of love. The greatest love you can show is when you lay down your life for your friends. A few verses later, he says this, again, this is what I'm commanding you to do. You must love each other. And then when he goes to Gethsemane and he prays the high priestly prayer, Two times he prays that we would be loving toward each other and that we would be one, that we would be unified. John 17, Jesus looks up to heaven and says, Father, time is glorify your son, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. And then down in verse 9 to 11, he says this. I'm not praying for the world. But I'm praying for those given to me because they belong to you. Now as I'm departing the world and I'm leaving them behind, Father, protect them by the power of your name so that they may be united as one 
just as we are one. Now that's his first mention of unity in John 17. But the whole chapter is about unity for the sake of mission, unity for the sake of the gospel. And in John, in verse 20, 20, 21 and 22, he says this, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for those who believe in me. You know this, you've preached this. Jesus was praying for you in the high priestly prayer. Jesus was praying for those who would believe. We're all here because the disciples did what Jesus told them, and then next generation did that. And my prayer is for all of them that they too will be one, just as you are in me and I am you, so they will be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me. Then finally, in, down he says, I'm giving you a new commandment. You must love each other the same way that I've loved you. Twice in John 17, Jesus says, I pray that they may be one so that the world may know. And then the next verse, next few verses later, I pray that they will be one so that the world may believe. The purpose of unity is not for the sake of unity. The purpose of unity is for the sake of evangelism. It is a witness to the world. Now, here I want to take two statements and wrap this up. I could talk to you about this for hours. The only way we will ever have unity is to love diversity. Write that down. The only way we will ever have unity in the body of Christ is to love diversity. Diversity was God's idea. Look around the room. Thank God he didn't make us all the same, look the same, smell the same, talk the same, act the same. It takes all kinds of people and all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of pe uh, people, lost people. The only way we will have unity so we can collaborate is to actually start not simply accepting diversity, tolerating diversity, but loving it, celebrating it. God wants unity, not uniformity. So we don't all need to do the same method, same style. Can anybody say amen to that? We need the gospel being preached in a thousands, tens of thousands different ways. God never made a clone of anything. Humans do, but God has never made a clone. Even identical twins are unique in thousands of ways. You have a unique thumbprint, voice print, mouth print, eye print. You have a unique heartbeat. You have a unique footprint. In thousands of ways, God broke the mold when he made you. God overdoses on diversity. And if the church is ever going to cooperate, and that's the only way we're going to complete the Great Commission, we've got to not simply love, uh, tolerate it. We have to love, love and enjoy diversity. He made us this way. When you get to heaven, God isn't going to say, why weren't you more like Billy Graham? Why weren't you more like your dad or your mother? Why weren't you more like your sister? When you get to heaven, God's going to say, why weren't you more like you? I made you to be you, so why don't you be you? We don't need two of anything. Two Rick Warrens would be a disaster in this world. We need you to be you. And we need to appreciate you and value you and as, in, as allies in the Great Commission. We, we have unity, but we have uniformity, without uniformity. I'll close. The reason I keep using this word ally is because I did a study in 2001. During COVID, we couldn't go a whole lot of places. I studied what are the fastest periods of mobilization of human beings in the history of mankind where they mobilized people for a cause very rapidly. Number one was the body of Christ in the first 320, 330 years. We grew 50% a decade for 33 decades. We went from 120 people in the upper room to over 15, 30 million and 60 million in the Roman Empire, half the Roman Empire. I have coins from the Roman Empire, 87, Caesar's on the coin, 8340, the cross of Christ is on the Roman denarius. That's culture change. How did they do it? No church buildings. No pulpits. There was no church building for 360, 40 years. There were no pulpits for 1,500 years. There were no 1,400 years. There were no Bibles for 1,500 years. All the stuff we think we have to have to spread the gospel, we don't have to have. 
God's work done God's way will not lack God's support. So I'm praying for you. But let's, let's figure out a way to collaborate. Let's figure out how to work together. Because the bottom line is that division, division destroys vision. It's division. You can't have a vision with division. What we need is to say, we're going to reach the world for Christ. Everybody has a Bible in their own heart language. Everybody, every believer is trained to share the good news. Every unbeliever gets to hear the gospel in a personal way. Everybody gets prayed for by name. Everybody has access to a church. These are fundamental things. And then every denomination and agency and nation can have all their other goals that they want to do uh, with that. But the bottom line is this. We need each other. We need each other. I need you, you need me, we, we need each other. So during this time together, let's start figuring out, we know how to fellowship. We know how to network. We know how to share ideas. We don't know how to get around and sit around a room and say, who's going to take that mountain? And who's going to take that mountain? And who's going to reach that people group and do that? And if we do that, it's a done deal. Let me pray for you. Would you bow your heads? Father, I look out on all these, my friends, that many of them we've known each other for decades. And I thank you for these allies. And just like in World War II, it wasn't one nation that won the World War. It was the allies, and everybody fought under their own flag. The French fought under the French flag, and the Australians fought under the Australian flag, and the Nigerians fought under the Nigerian flag. We need that kind of unity without uniformity to complete the Great Commission. I'm praying that James's vision for this week, Billion Souls Harvest, will become a reality. I'm praying, Father, that somehow we'll be able to say we can fly under our own flag and still work together as allies to finish the task of the Great Commission. We don't need everybody to be in the same denomination, same organization, same logo. We need the strength of diversity. Thank you for creating a world that is infinitely diverse. And may we celebrate that. And may we do the five things that Jesus did. Proclaim the good news, equip believers, alleviate suffering, contend in prayer, and establish churches. You have said, I will build my church. I pray you protect the physical health of everybody in this room. Protect their families. Protect their finances so they don't have to worry about bills if you can focus totally on you. And one day when we get to heaven, may we all be there and rejoice the people that have been saved because we work together. Bless every agency, every church, every business, every denomination, every educational institution, and every focused outreach that is committed to the global glory of God. For we pray this blessing in your name, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you. Amen. Pastor Rick, Reverend David Huang from the convener of Billion Soul Harvest would like to present you with an honorary appreciation award. So he's coming right there. He's right beside you. I didn't know about this. <laughs> it's a surprise. Yeah. On behalf of Billion Soul Harvest, Thank you, my name. Uh, the convener, Dr. David Huang, will present a special appreciation plaque. Oh, wow. Do I get a free meal with this? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Anytime. All right. With one greatest appreciation presented to Rick Warren. In recognition of your lifelong dedication to spreading the gospel and sharing God's love worldwide, your unwavering service, humility, and compassion have transformed countless lives and left an enduring legacy in the kingdom of God. Through your leadership, the vision of the billions of harvest 
has been rekindled, uniting believers in prayer and action. We gratefully honor you today for your extraordinary commitment to advancing God's kingdom. Presented by Billions of Harvest, Global Harvest Summit, September 30th, 2024. <laughs> yeah, let's give it up to God for the man of God here. Thank Praise you. the Lord. Thank you. I'm touched by this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you. Guys. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, friends. Thank you, friends. Yes, of course. Can I, can I just say 15 seconds? I wrote a book that the first four words of the book were, it's not about you. Many times since I wrote those words, I wished I never wrote them. Because I had no idea that I would be tested on them every day of my life, the rest of my life. I'm serious about this, guys. Uh, when people praise me, I go, it's not about you. When people criticize me, I go, it's not about you. No matter. People hate me. It's not about you. And I didn't know I was going to be tested on it the rest of my life. So don't write those words, okay? <laughs> because you will be tested the rest of your life. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about the global glory of God. I love you guys.